In this video, I'm going to complement the main lecture with some of the content that was left out, um, specifically about how to identify some common sources of bias and some examples of biased samples. So we were talking about sampling, right, which is this method of obtaining a small subgroup from the population and then measuring this subgroup in order to uh, be able to make an inference about the population. And then I talked about biased sampling, biased sample, right? What's a biased sample? A biased sample is any sample that's not perfectly or uh, that's not representative of the population, right? So a representative sample, as we discussed, is a sample that is random. So if every element of the population has the exact same probability of being uh, picked in a random sample, then that would be the best possible sample but that's rarely feasible only in um in, in real world real world that's that's rarely feasible so most samples will have bias anyway and then i told you that you have to be able to discuss the bias and identify the bias and these are, are some of the common sources of bias that you could have in your sample so for example response bias people may not be likely to respond truthfully due to the sensitivity of the subject. So if you ask something that people may feel um, that they, well, they, they maybe they, they don't feel safe about answering it. So maybe they're, I don't know, they're living in an unsafe country where you cannot say anything bad about the government, for example. And then you, you ask them, what do you think about the government? And they probably will say, I feel fine. And I feel that's the great. Uh, not not everyone will have the guts to actually say something um, as opposed to that. Bec even if you affirm that, no, no, this is completely anonymous and nobody will ever know, blah, blah, they may still feel like it's not safe. So then, of course, you have a sample, uh, a bias in your sample, right? Because your sample um, will not represent the actual truth. So it's biased. And there are other types of response bias also. In, in any situation where people will simply not respond truthfully for whatever reason. Uh, there's under coverage, which is that not all members of the population have the same probability of being sampled. This is, I think, the most common one. And this is the one that we have been talking about earlier. Like if you sample people from um, outside of, um, of a restaurant or in an, in an event, a sports event, and so on. In these places, um, you know, you have, a, you have specific uh, elements of the population who are more likely to be sampled for your research because they, they go to these places more than or other people, let's say. So these, these, are not, um, these are not places where you can just randomly sample every possible member of the population, right? Um, usually. And, and again, it's almost impossible to, to run away from this. You know, perfect uh, research doesn't exist. So this is just a matter of identifying it and discussing it. Another common uh, type of bias is voluntary response. So what, what does that mean? Voluntary response is when you're actually very interested in that research, either positively or negatively. So you're actually, you're more likely to participate because you can, I, I mean you, but I mean the person who is participating uh, actually uh, sometimes even goes after the research that I want to respond to this research. And that's not random, right? That's, that's not a random sample. If you have a bunch of people who want to necessarily, or they really want to participate from the research, then, you know, uh, that's not random. Because again, there's a certain amount of people who are more likely to, to be sampled than the rest. And this is, this is common when, when you're talking about some kind of a, um, a political thing, for example, you know, there are some people who are very strongly positive towards some kind of a new thing that's being voted or, or very strongly negative uh, positions, then they will, they want to participate because they want their voices to be heard. Um, so in, the, in, the, in those cases, it's hard to actually uh, have a clear picture of what everyone, you know, those who are not super uh, interested in participating, uh, what, what does everyone think about that? Convenience bias is also very common, especially when it comes to like, for example, the course, our course or the assignments and just, uh, you know, academic research in general, simply because 
the researchers don't have uh, any clear, let's say, facilities for looking for random people to participate in the experiment. So you have an experiment, you plan an experiment, then you need people to participate. And in your case, for example, you have a tool, you have developed a prototype and you need someone to evaluate it. So the most, most likely you will end up like selecting people who happen to be easy for you to reach. So your friends, your family, people who are close to you, people who, who you can just, Hey, can you please do this for me? And they say, yeah, because, or else you would have to just walk around and asking random people in the street. And that would be, I guess, not very common. Right. So that's, I mean, not everyone has, feels, feels comfortable in just walking around and asking random people to do stuff. So, um, so this is very common for, for courses like, like ours or even for researchers who need people to, to, to help them with the experiment and they just don't know where to reach. So again, identify and discuss. Non-response. Me, people may decide not to participate in the research. So again, it is a little bit like a response bias in that people participate but do not respond truthfully. In this case, people can simply say, I don't want to. So suppose, for example, that you do some kind of a random sampling um, of the population of Sweden by using one of these directories. You know, you have these websites where you can see where everyone lives, which is kind of weird, but anyway. Um, and then let's say you do a random sampling of that and, and then you get the phone number of, of that person and then you call them and say, hey, I'm doing some research. Can you, can you please answer a couple of questions? And they'll say no. Uh, you're, you're strange. You just called me randomly out of nowhere. I don't know who you are. I'm not going to participate in your research. So this is non-response. This is different than response bias, although they're, they're related. Right. And, and to be honest, a, such a random sample would be actually pretty good if, if you have a good amount of people who actually answer. So for example, suppose you still do the, do it anyway, even though some people don't want to answer. Uh, so you just keep random sampling, uh, the, um, the, the directory of phones, telephones that you can find. And, and that would be a quite, quite an interesting random, you know, a sample because I mean, I guess that like not everyone, but most people are in there and, and, and that would really be random. So, so as long as you say, okay, I called 300 people and I got 30 people out of those 300 that I called, uh, you see, Again, the, the random, the sample itself is not perfect, but you've discussed it. You said, okay, there is obviously a non-response bias here because I like 90% of the people I called did not answer. Uh, but you know, it is what it is and that's what I got. And, and these are my results. As long as it's clear for, for the person who is reading it, that's no problem. I mean, of course, in general, because maybe, maybe you can actually just at, at the end, you can just realize, you know what, this random, this, this sample actually just doesn't work. So I have to do something else. Could, could happen also, not for our course. In our course, if you have a bias and you discuss it, you say, look, I have this bias and I have that bias and I can't run away from it. No problem. And, and then I'm going to, discuss a couple of examples of biased samples and why they're biased, right? So this one is a very, very simple one. Uh, it's an election poll. I just want to know which candidate's more probable uh, to win. It's just two candidates, right? Uh, just for simplification. Uh, so which of these sampling procedures would be better and why? Let's, let's take a look at them. If I go to candidate A's hometown and ask random people in the street who they'll vote for, then do the same in candidate B's hometown. So I say, okay, I, I went to candidate A, A's hometown and I asked random people in the street. And then in order to compensate for that, because, I'll, because I thought, okay, if I go to candidate A's hometown, then I guess I'm more likely to, to get people who like him and will vote for him. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe he's really hated in his hometown and that's also bad anyway. But both ways you get on a biased sample because it's not really just a sample that represents the general people who don't know him or who are not from his hometown. But let's say I do that and say, mm, you know what? My, my, my sample is very biased because I went to his hometown. So I will compensate and go to the other guy's hometown um, and, and do the same. So then I get biased against biased and that's it. Well, not really. 
you just you just have two different possibly different bias samples which are actually conflicting with each other. So maybe you have one sample where everyone likes candidate A very much, one sample where everyone likes candidate B very much, and then when you take the average, then it doesn't mean anything because it's just in the middle. And, and you, cannot, you, you can't simply just assume that just because it's in the middle, it's correct because maybe, maybe the general population have some other opin opinion, right? So you should avoid actually candidate A's hometown and avoid candidate B's hometown simply because they are outliers. They're not part of, you know, a good random sample. Again, of course, in the, the situation where you could, you could randomly sample everyone for, from every town, then, it's, then, then the, these two hometowns, they could be like, it's still considered as a random thing that could be just like everyone else. Yeah. But since you can't, and since you you have to just go somewhere and, ras and ask random people in the street, then it might be better to just avoid them both because they're both for sure biased. Then you could, second option, uh, you could call random people by automatically generating random phone numbers, including mobile, and ask them who they will vote for. This is actually something that people do, right? Uh, when, especially in places like the United States where there is no like centralized uh, phone registry or anything like that. Uh, in Sweden, you might not have to because you have, I guess, other options to get some kind of a registry. For, I don't know if you can actually, but I mean, I'm just assuming. But let's just consider that you can do that. You can call random people and automatically generate their, their random phone numbers so that there is no bias in terms of uh, which number you're actually generating. You're just generating numbers. It's kind of kind of crazy, but it's, it's possible. Uh, that's, that is a very good random sample. You, you might have response bias here still, like we discussed, but that would be a very good sample because it's, it would really be random. So all possible factors would just kind of get uh, smoothed out by the randomness of the sample. Number three, ask your family and friends who they will vote for. I guess that's um, obvious, obviously not a good sample. Uh, and it's a, because it suffers of convenience bias, right? Uh, it's just people who are close to you and then it's just so easy for you to reach them to just ask them. Uh, ask randomly picked attendants from a nearby scientific conference who they'll vote for. Well, uh, randomly picked attendants from a nearby scientific conference. What's the problem here? They're randomly picked, but they are randomly picked from the scientific conference. And the, I guess that if you have a certain candidate that has more scientific, it's more scientifically, let's say, or, or you know, talks more about science and research, and you have another candidate who doesn't talk about science or who actually talks about things like, uh, you know, decreasing the funding for science or anything like that. Some, some people do that. So, uh, so they will be biased. The, the people who are in the scientific conference will probably be biased one way or another, unless both candidates are super connected to the scientific community in, in exactly equal terms, which I don't expect. Some, some uh, candidates are usually more connected to, to the scientific community and also uh, depending on the party that you come from, sometimes the party itself already has some, you know, the people prefer that part, this party or that party. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that they are um, biased. Uh, they are unbiased. I would say that they have the bi uh, bias of uh, voluntary response. That's, I forgot that for a second there. Uh, you got a voluntary response bias here because they, they know that they are really interested in seeing the, the person who is, uh, who, who some, somehow talks more about science. So they're more interested in having that person um, elected. And then you have post two online polls, one in A's Facebook page and one in B's. That's the same. It's the same as, um, as the number one. Actually, not exactly the same. Why is it not exactly the same? Because not only you're, you're in A's Facebook and B's fa Facebook page, but also like not everyone has Facebook. Not everyone is actually online all the time. Uh, so, so you also have this extra 
kind of bias where you're you're taking you're you're randomly uh, sampling people who are actually online so i don't know maybe younger people so your your population will be a younger kind of audience that is online all the time and that actually goes and and, and answers stuff on facebook so um, so that's also a source of bias right because well obviously not everyone's online all the time not everyone's in, in there's even a smaller amount of people actually actually on facebook there's even a smaller amount of people on that actually go to a certain politician and and subscribe to their page so there's also a voluntary bias here a voluntary response bias here because these people are probably people who are really like these guys so it's it's even worse actually than the candidate's hometown if you think about it because in a the hometown there's just a bunch of people but if you're um, if you're actually in in a in, subscribe to a facebook page of a politician then probably you really you're really interested in in that guy winning so um so that's even worse that's a whole bunch of biases in this proposition now second example of sampling with possible bias um after you finish developing the first version of your prototype for your thesis this is kind of a realistic um, scenario you call some friends and family members and ask them to try it out then I'll oh, ask them to try it out and then rate it from one, I don't like it, to five, I like it very much. The final average score was 4.8. So everyone liked it very much mostly, with a few exceptions. After that, you decide to do something different. You randomly select a subset of your Facebook friends, so Facebook friends, then you send them the link for your prototype, but you don't ask them to rate it. You ask them to do the same to randomly select a subset of their friends, which are not your friends. So you say, okay, those who are friends with both of us, don't include them. Just include people from the outside circle, let's say. And then send them the link and ask them to rate it. So people who don't know me, to so just a bunch of people who don't know me. Um, the final average score was 2.6. Are there biases in your two sampling procedures? obviously right in both of them but one is stronger than the other for sure for example the number uh, letter a is just convenience bias period right you just send to some friends and family members you're very very likely to get heavily biased results that probably don't mean anything you might still do it anyway, because for example, you might put, you might be in a position where you say, look, it's either this or nothing. Uh, and you have your thesis ready and you need to do it, then you might still do it and people do it. Okay. Um, which is not optimal. You sh in, in real life research, so real life research, so to speak, um, for having like the best grade for having an A and, and doing the research in the best way possible, that should never be the case. Okay, let's just make it very clear. This should never be the case if you're working in a research project, right? However, the truth is that in practice, sometimes people do it. And as long as you discuss it very clearly in your thesis and you say, okay, these are the people who I sampled from. Uh, and then the examiner will obviously take that into account. So just make, make sure that if you do this, it looks very, very clear in your thesis, okay? Now, the second one, there's also a bias there because it's not, they're not your friends, okay, but they're friends of your friends. So in a way, it's a convenience sampling, right? It is convenience sampling, but it's a convenience sampling uh, that's, that's slightly more pushed away from you. So you, you in, intentionally pushed away the convenience sampling a little bit. To make sure that you meet people that you get people that you don't know or they don't know you uh, so there is still convenient sampling because you're still not of obviously not sampling randomly right so there is bias uh, not everyone in 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 the complete population is actually has the same probability of being sampled but you pushed it away a little bit so if you had to choose one of the two uh, procedures then you would choose b but you would still discuss the bias. There's still convenience bias, blah, 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 you discuss this, but you say, you, you show how you tried to just avoid it as much as you could, though 
not perfect. So which one is probably more accurate? Well, letter A for sure has like a very high uh, probability of giving you good grades, right? Good scores, right? Because they're, they're family members, your friends, they know how hard you worked for, with this. They know how many nights you spent. They know how stressed you were. So obviously they will give you a good grade most of the time. Letter B, maybe, maybe not. I mean, still they know that their friends are friends, but it's, I mean, it's a friend of a friend and they, they don't know. I mean, it's an anonymous thing. You don't have to put your name or anything. So it's, it's a little bit more okay to be more, I guess, more honest in, in what's happening. Um, but still, there's also probably um, non-response bias. So probably people will, will choose not to do it a lot of the time. I mean, if I get a request like that, I'm, I'm not sure depending on how many time I have, if I'm okay, if I'm comfortable, I might do it, but not always. Uh, so uh, some biases are still there, right? And uh, I would say the letter B is probably the most accurate one. 